All right, I was saying, you probably heard me say already that I'd like to thank the NHGRI for organizing this meeting. It's, um, it's sort of bittersweet in a way. It's been great to work with everybody in the Modern Code Project um, on the NIH side and, and also all these scientists. I'm sure we'll work together in the future. Um, but it's nice to have a meeting uh, like this to sort of uh, put everything in perspective uh, at the end. Uh, so today I wanted to talk about how, specifically about how the modern code data, the modern code chromatin data might inform us about human chromatin. And I, I wanted to sort of start off by saying that there's no question, I mean, there's no question about the fact that um, these model organisms in particular, flies and worms, uh, have informed us about um, the function of human chromatin. I think it's safe to say that most of what we know about the function of human chromatin was learned in model organisms. I don't think that's, that's really in doubt. So that's sort of the baseline uh, from which we're working. Specifically in, in flies, uh, you know, there, there are people sitting in this room, Sally, who, you know, discovered or characterized DNA hypersensitive sites in flies in the late 1970s and uh, early 1980s, you know, polycomb, trithorax, heterochromatin protein 1, all these things uh, that we know about were learned about in, in models, and that continues to be the case today. Um, and in worms, of course, RNAi, uh, microRNAs, uh, a lot of things that are associated with chromatin uh, were discovered in, in worms as well. Um, let's see, does this thing work? I'll just use the keyboard. Okay, so um, we we have generated a lot of data in the modern code project. We've uh, d just to just to give you an idea of, of of the types of data that are out there. Um, for worms, we have a total of 291 data sets, mostly over three developmental time points. So these are whole animal uh, experiments, mostly early embryo, uh, third larval stage, and adult, although there are other stages. Um, and uh, we've done 133 different profiles of 30 different histone marks, uh, 147 profiles of 72 different non-histone chromosomal proteins, a couple of which I'll talk about today. Um, and we took, a, we, we took a strategy of generating antibodies to these proteins, so we generated a total of 451 polyclonal antibodies, 288 of which were validated by at least one assay that, that uh, meets the consortium standards, so that's immunofluorescence or um, western blot, and a subset of these were the ones that were used for these chip experiments, so they work in, in chromatin IPs as well. Um, and most of this data was from, from our group, and uh, Gary's group, uh, along with, I think this includes some data from Dave, uh, have 601 fly data sets, mostly over three cell lines, so they have the advantage of having cell lines, which are not available in worms, plus some whole animal experiments in embryos, larval stages, and adults as well. And so they have 288 profiles of 28 different histone marks, and 313 profiles of about 50 different um, non-histone chromosomal protein. So we have a fairly compatible um, data set in terms of scope and size. Um, but I'm not going to talk about how we can use all of this data together. Um, it, we, we've already heard talks about that um, from Mark Gerstin, who talked about how we can use all this chromatin data to try to predict gene expression states, for example, and build networks, and from Manolis Kellis about how we can use this uh, data to create states, so how combinations of these marks work together to specify biological function. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is just talk about two stories that I think um, led to unique insights that, that uh, were, were generated by the Modern Code Project, and how the Modern Code data might be used by researchers um, to uh, uh, really translate into human knowledge. Wanna... Oh, great. Thank you. All right, so the first has to do with centromere specification, so how centromeres are specified. Centromeres are obviously the, the, the DNA sequences that allow chromosomes to segregate during mitosis. Um, and the second has to do with um, interactions between chromosomes and the nuclear envelope, um, and, uh, and, and, and in both C. elegans and, uh, and how that might relate to, um, to human disease. Okay. So, the first thing to know about centromeres is that centromeric DNA is not conserved. So you might think that this is a horrible place to look uh, to use model organisms to, to, to study human biology. In budding yeast, for example, the centromere is only 125 bases 
long. Uh, it's, a, it's exactly the centromere is one nucleosome wide. Um, whereas in fission yeast, it can be from 40 kb to 100 kb. Fruit fly, it's 400 kb, uh, and, and there's a lot of repetitive sequence involved. And humans can be up to five megabases of uh, repetitive DNA, mostly alpha satellite, but also other repeats. But the interesting thing is uh, that this alpha satellite DNA is neither necessary nor sufficient for centromere function. So wh whatever, whatever is specifying centromere activity um, is not conserved and is actually not even necessary or, or sufficient for, for its activity. And these repeats cause a lot of problems in studying human centromeres, right? Because uh, uh, repetitive DNA is just very difficult to get a handle on. So C. elegans, along with some other insects and plants, are, have a different strategy, which, are, which is, they're called holocentrics, which means they don't have a point centromere. The centromere is essentially the entire chromosome. And in worms, uh, this, as you'll see, allows us to study centromere function uh, because there's, we can get around uh, all these repeats. So the, what, is, what is conserved among all these organisms are the components that make up the centromeres. So uh, kinetochores, which are the protein component of, of, of uh, the, the segregation machinery, assemble on chromatin containing a histone H3 variant called SEMPA. So this is just an alignment of SEMPA with H3, and, and basically it, there's a lot of variation in this amino terminus. Um, and so uh, this SEMPA uh, molecule substitutes for histone H3 in the altered nucleosomes at, at the kinetochore. So in C. elegans, you can see that the entire chromosome actually acts as a centromere. It's, it's coded by these kinetochore proteins. Um, and uh, this is SEMPA this is in red. In Drosophila, you get sort of a traditional kind of point centromere with SEMPA incorporation there, right? Uh, I'll also just mention that SEMPA and its, and its chaperone um, are overexpressed in many human cancers. And if you overexpress SEMPA um, uh, or chaperone in uh, flies, you can, you can get ectopic, uh, kinetic, uh, ectopic kinetochores and missegregation mis of chromosomes and aneuploidy. Okay, so, so how does it look? Um, just to give you an idea, so here's the DNA over here, and this is the centromere. There's a structure called the inner plate and the outer plate. The centromeric chromatin is thought to be arranged like this, where SEMPA is incorporated into the DNA in patches that are then looped in a way that presents them to the outer uh, surface of the inner plate. Okay, so, so there, there are these domains, but they form sort of a continuous surface when they're arranged properly. And a big question has been, how do you propagate this organization from one cellular generation to the next, or in an extreme case, in the first, very first division uh, in an early embryo? And the idea has been that you do it by looking to see where the old SEMPE is, and wherever there was SEMPE before, you just put a new batch, right? And so uh, after DNA replication, there's SEMPE, some SEMPE associated with um, both strands, and, uh, and, the, and uh, then you just incorporate new SEMPE, um, sort of where the old one is, to fill in the gaps. This has been shown to be uncoupled from DNA replication itself. It occurs late in anaphase and early in G1 in mammals and Drosophila. And it's known that uh, this process, whatever it is, uh, requires special, specialized machinery, which is also conserved, including a protein called KNL2, which I'll mention in a second again. Now, there's some evidence that this old to new um, strategy may not, or, or hypothesis may not be entirely accurate, because there are some very interesting cases, although they're rare, of, of neocentrum, neocentromeres that um, occur in humans. So for example, this is a, a two gen these are chromosomes from a two-generation family in which um, they, this is a chromosome four, and normally the centromere is here, and you can see that the alpha satellite DNA is still here, but the SEMP-A, is, which is in green, has moved to a new location. And this, they're perfectly, this family is perfectly normal. They have uh, their chromosomes segregate normally, but the centromere just moved, right? And so uh, this, this happens occasionally, and um, in addition to that, uh, centromere repositioning is common among very closely related species. So centromeres can move around even away from the repetitive DNA that's usually um, considered to be a hallmark of centromere function, okay? Secondly, uh, if we look in C. elegans, um, the question is how do, you, how do you set up these domains in the early embryo? There's no SEMPA in C. elegans sperm, okay? And so this is true by microscopy. So what, what this shows is the sperm are over here. And if we have a SEMPA, GFP, right, we can see there's no SEMPA um, in, in sperm at all. 
And uh, this is just to show that there's some background uh, fluorescence in sperm. But basically, there's no SEMPE in sperm, but it's all in oocytes. And we can do this by quantitative immunoblotting, too, where we have recombinant SEMPE, and we can titrate it down and show that with purified sperm, you get basically no band. And this would tell us if we had it, uh, so this can tell us that we have less than 300 SEMPE molecules um, per sperm. Uh, so uh, we can all, there, there can, there's also experiments that show that the sperm chromatin, um, when, so, so there, the uh, C. elegans oocyte is fertilized by the sperm, and eventually the, the, the sperm and oocyte nucleus merge together uh, and undergo the first division. And what, what has been shown is that, uh, so here's the um, uh, wild type oocyte, and if we look at the sperm uh, nucleus, which is what we're looking at here, you can see that it acquires SEMPE only after it enters the oocyte cytoplasm. So it recruits SEMPE from the oocyte cytoplasm. If SEMPE is depleted from the oocyte, basically there's no SEMPE that gets, in, that, that gets incorporated for the first division. Okay, so neos, the, the neocentromeres, the, the fact that SEMPE is absent from uh, mature sperm and recruited from oocyte cytoplasm at fertilization, and the fact that, which I didn't show you, that SEMPE is removed and reloaded uh, in meiotic prophase kind of all are argue against uh, this idea that old SEMPE is used to mark the position of new SEMPE. So if it's not old to new, then, then what is it? So as I told you before, the repetitive sort of nature of the human centromeres prevented study of, of those by, for example, chip-seq or chip-chip analysis. What a holocentric chromosome allows us to do is that basically the centromeres are in euchromatic regions, so we can actually study those. So um, Arshad Desai, who's a member of our consortium, did a, a chip with SEMPE, which is the histone variant. Um, and at the time, we were using uh, genome tiling arrays, but the data uh, looked beautiful. And, uh, and here's just a representation, so you guys all know the chip procedure. We put them on very high-density oligonucleotide arrays. And, uh, and here's what the data looked like. So SEMPE, uh, this is just shown as a z-score display of, uh, a, a log, of log two ratios. And you can see that there are these ex very discrete regions um, where SEMPE is incorporated across the entire length of the chromosome. Okay. There's a very broad distribution of, of SEMPE. 47% of the genome seems to be covered by SEMPE. And we also, uh, also chipped KNL2, which is the protein I mentioned before that's conserved. And the pattern is identical between SEMPE and KNL2. So this is independent verification of this. Now this brings up, and so here, here's the relationship between KNL2 and SEMPE, so that's good. This brings up a, a, a point that was made yesterday in the panel discussion, which is what does occupancy mean? So how do you interpret this signal, right? What Arshad did, again, by using quantitative immunoblotting, was show that, uh, show that given the number of SEMPE molecules in, per nucleus, maximally 4% of the nucleosomes can be SEMPE nucleosomes. So what that means is, we, we, but we enrich for 47% of the genome, right? So how's that possible? Well, what the reason it's possible, and I imagine that this is true for almost every chip experiment, is that you're not actually chipping, you know, where the protein is in every cell, right? You're, chi you're chipping regions that are permissive uh, for the binding of that protein, right? So what this means is that if we see a region like this that we're calling SEMP-A positive, actually, uh, it's actually uh, incorporated at, at low density in that region. Maybe one in 10 nucleosomes in that region are SEMP-A, but they can be incorporated anywhere within that window, right? So these are the kinds of experiments that are required to actually start to interpret what occupancy means. And so what, what defines these permissive regions? Um, at first, it looked like, in embryos, that it was simply a matter of, um, of basically uh, an inverse correlation with RNA polymerase II and gene expression. So for example, this gene, CLE1, is a, is a gene that's not expressed. This is SEMPE data from early embryos. This is a gene that's not expressed until after, embry after embryogenesis, whereas these genes are expressed during embryogenesis. And it looked like, it could be the case, that SEMPE is just excluded from regions that are transcribed in the embryo. That's a very simple model for how you set it up, right? And when we looked at RNA Pol2, we got this beautiful inverse correlation between RNA polymerase II distribution and SEMPE. So that was consistent with that interpretation. 
Um, but there are some puzzling aspects to this model that make it seem like it might not make sense. Uh, the first is that there's no significant zygotic transcription until the 30 cell stage. Um, but in fact, th this organization is uh, present during all the early divisions. So how would you set that up? Um, the early divisions are also completely normal if you inhibit Pol2, RNA-Pol2 completely. So th that didn't seem to be consistent with that model. Uh, and there's no, and the other thing is that there's no change in SEMP A pattern during development from the, from the early eight cell stage to the, to, to the greater than 250 cell stage, even though gene expression patterns are very dynamic. So these all argue against the simple model that polymerase is just kicking out SEMP-A um, and uh, the other places are retaining it. So the clue uh, to, to what might be going on came with when we started dividing up genes in, in embryos and asking about the relationship between RNA-Pol2 and SEMP-A. And the, the, if we took different categories of genes, you can just focus on this ubiquitous, we saw the typical um, relationship I just showed, which is that if you have a lot of polymer, if you have a lot of RNA-Pol2, you don't have a lot of SEMP-A. But there was one class of genes where you didn't have RNA-Pol2 in the embryo and you also didn't have SEMP-A. And these genes were genes that were expressed only in the germline and not in the embryos, right? So this was a clue to what, to what was happening. And here's, an, here's another example of these doubly negative genes. So these are, these are all genes, these four genes are all genes that are expressed only in the germline but not in the embryo. And what you can see is that there's no polymerase in the um, embryo and there's also no SEMP-A uh, in the embryo. So basically these are reasons of exclusion that also don't have RNA-Pol2. So the model based on this now was different, which was that it's actually germline transcription that defines the regions from which SEMP-A is excluded in the embryo. So we're talking about a truly epigenetic phenomenon now where the maternal germline defines the centromere positions um, essentially in the uh, developing embryo. And so if germline transcription was on, uh, then it was not permissive for SEMP-A. If germline transcription was off, it is permissive for SEMP-A. And we can test this model by driving uh, ectopic expression in the germline where it shouldn't be using this um, uh, mutant that is not required for fertility called MET1. And that uh, causes certain genes to be overexpressed in the germline. This is one of them, it's 370 fold overexpressed. And we can also measure uh, H3K36 trimethylation in the embryos, which marks germline expressed genes throughout embryogenesis. And this was shown separately by um, Susan Strom and Bill Kelly. So here's a gene that's ectopically expressed in the germline. Um, and, we can, and we can show that there's no RNA polymerase II at this locus in embryos, right? So then we can ask, is this locus particularly depleted in SEMP-A in the embryo? And the answer is yes. So here's the wild type SEMP-A pattern. And here's the pattern in MET1, where this gene's expressed in the germline, but not in the embryo. And we can see that SEMP-A is depleted from this region, even though um, it, it normally would be if, if, um, if this gene hadn't been expressed. So there's many, many examples of this that we can show. In fact, um, out of, uh, we, we were able to show over 75 of these um, that have this relationship out of, um, out of a 132 that were um, kind of classified in this category. So, uh, so that sort of confirms that the uh, mechanism by which regions permissive for SEMP-A incorporation are determined um, occur by a, a memory of what genes had been transcribed in the maternal germline. And there are many candidate mechanisms for this, some of which depend on other modern code data. Um, that was generated by, uh, which is H3K36 trimethylation data, and also the distribution of MES4, which is an H3K36 methyltransferase, which was also published. And there's also uh, an interesting connection possibly to uh, this uh, protein called CSR1, CSR1, which is an argonaut, and uh, these 22G small RNAs. So we don't know the mechanism yet, um, but uh, the, uh, it, it is a, a truly interesting phenomenon that would never have been possible to, to discover in human cells. And, and uh, furthermore, we don't know yet um, whether or not this mechanism uh, is relevant to humans, but the fact that all of the chaperone machinery and the components of centromeres are conserved um, make it at least a strong possibility, especially given the fact that you can get neocentromeres and so on um, without 
uh, the, the repetitive DNA that's often associated with centromeres. Okay, so the conclusions are that sempe nucleosomes can be guided by cues that are not pre-existing sempe nucleosomes. We have a, a truly epigenetic phenomenon, not, a, uh, not just in name. So it's transgenerational epigenetic memory of gene expression uh, that regulates histone variant incorporation. Um, and finally, germline expression, which genes are expressed in the germline, might influence which sites are chosen for centromere repositioning uh, during evolution. So this is a, um, just one example of a result that really required a model organism to get to the bottom of. Okay. So now I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna in, in the uh, last five minutes, I'm just gonna quickly uh, tell you about a story that has to do um, with mapping interactions between chromosomes in the nuclear envelope, and Susan Mango uh, alluded, alluded to this earlier, uh, and its connection to uh, a human disease, um, hutchinson gilford progeria and other laminopathies. Okay, so, uh, C. elegans is actually a nice model for, for nuclear uh, lamina function because, it, first of all, it has a nuclear lamina, unlike uh, cerevisiae, um, so yeast don't have these proteins. Um, it has uh, only one lamin, not two, like humans, and so it's probably the simplest um, model uh, for nuclear lamin uh, chromosome interactions that there is. Um, instead of lamin, we use a protein called LEM2, which is uh, in a nuclear membrane protein that uh, interacts with the lamins uh, and also with, chromo uh, with, with chromatin and, and did chromatin IP. So we have a you know, very nice antibody against um, LEM2. And uh, we got this really striking result that Susan um, introduced, which is that the arms of the C. elegans chromosomes are kind of a, really highly associated with the nuclear membrane and the centers are sort of looped out. And so these are just uh, representations of the chromosomes. Um, also, these large LEM2 domains consist of small subdomains. So if we take a closer look at these regions um, at the arms, they're not continuous. So they're, they're these discontinuous associations, and there are small gaps um, within that break up the subdomains in these, in these larger um, regions. Uh, and here's just another kind of example of these gaps. Um, and a, a typical gap is about 12 KB, whereas a typical um, subdomain you know, might be 60 KB. And what we, um, and, and so you, you end up with a picture like this. The, the X is a little different from the autosomes. The autosomes are sort of plastered for the most part against the nuclear membrane, but if you zoom in, um, there are these little loops that emanate out from the membrane. And what we found was that in those, inside those loops, uh, by, by, by putting the data together, so here's, uh, here's the LEM2 by array, and here's the LEM2 by seq. The data is totally consistent. So if we take a gap like this, and we look what's in the gap, you see RNA polymerase two in the gap, um, H3K4 trimethylation, HTZ1, right? So, so basically you see all the marks of, um, of, of transcription in the gap, uh, and what we think might be happening is that these, uh, and we also show that the size of the gap is inversely proportional to the level of transcription. So the smaller the gap, the higher the level of transcription uh, tends to be. And so these little bubbles uh, might be uh, wells to concentrate factors, uh, maybe for promoting higher residency times and component recycling um, at the membrane. But importantly, and, and this is why the, it, it, the connection is a little bit different in this case to human biology, what this did was made us comfortable with working with nuclear membrane proteins, and we developed protocols to work with nuclear membrane proteins, and it inspired us to apply for another grant uh, to the Pro Progeria Research Foundation to try to do chip experiments on human lamins. And the reason, um, I'll, I'll just say that this is, uh, these relationships are conserved among different organisms. The reason that we uh, applied to the Progeria Research Foundation is that um, hutchinson gilford progeria um, is caused, which is basically, a, a, it's more complicated, but it's a premature aging disease, average lifespan of 13 years, and the cause of death are causes of death that you'd normally associate with aging, so heart attack and stroke and so on. It's a rare disease, mostly caused by um, uh, spontaneous mutations. And uh, those mutations occur in the lamin AC gene, um, uh, the human lamin AC gene. And, and basically it's an activation of a, it, their dominant mutations, activating a cryptic splice site that causes deletion of 50 amino acids. And th this protein is farnsylated. Um, and the mutant version 
typically retains um, uh, far insulation, whereas normally it's proteolytically cleaved off. So, so basically this, this, these dominant mutations can cause um, a deletion of the region that is recognized by a protease that would normally cleave off the part that's far insulated. Okay, there's also many other uh, uh, laminopathies as well. And so um, we were able to successfully chip lamin A from human cells. Um, and uh, basically, this is, as far as we know, the first successful genome-wide chip of lamin A. And basically, we can show that it, it associates with active regulatory regions, so it overlaps with marks like H3K27 acetyl. So this is different than lamin B, which is sort of the expected result. Um, and uh, it, it's inversely correlated with the distribution of lamin B, so we get clusters lamin A association where lamin B is missing. And of course, the next experiment was to look in um, uh, cells that were derived from progeria patients that have progerin, which is the mutant form of lamin AC. And for the most part, um, the results are the same. Um, but we do identify regions of uh, chromosomes that lose their association with um, the membrane in, in progerin cells, and we found there's, there's many, many more regions that lose association than gain association with the, with the membrane, which is a, a little bit surprising. And we're also, there's a drug currently in clinical trials that's a farnsyl transferase inhibitor for progeria, and we're currently doing chip experiments in uh, cells that are treated by, with that farnsyl transferase inhibitor. The interesting thing about that drug is that it partially relieves the symptoms. It relieves many of the cell morphological symptoms. Uh, it partially relieves uh, sym symptoms in uh, cell culture and in mice. Um, the clinical trial is ongoing in humans, but it's clear that it doesn't rescue all the defects. So it would be of great interest to know um, which of the membrane chromosome interactions might be rescued uh, by this drug and which ones aren't. Okay, um, so I just told you two stories, uh, one about centromere specification, the other about understanding interactions between chromosomes and the membrane that I think really um, model organisms made unique contributions to understanding uh, what the situation was uh, in human biology. And uh, this is j the people who did the work. So the Sempe work was completely, or was done mostly in our Shah Desai's lab. These are the people in Aredo and Arshad's lab and Andreas and Susan Strom's lab really drove this uh, forward. That was recently published in Kota Ikigami in my lab, ha has did the LEM2 and Progerin work, and he also has done some really nice work on nuclear pores that I didn't talk about. And here are all the PIs in the worm chromatin groups, the Erringer, Durenberg, Desai, um, and Strom labs, and our data analysis folks are Shirley Liu and Aran Segal, and uh, the fly chromatin group, which I didn't get a chance uh, to talk about the fly stories, um, but Sally, uh, Gary, uh, Mitzi Kuroda, Vince Prada, um, Peter Park, who's doing a lot of the joint analysis, and Dave McAlpine uh, has a separate grant but associates with these, with these guys a lot. So thank you very much. That was great, Jason. Um, I'm just wondering about how you think about uh, the fact that worms are diploid. Yep. There's one set that came from the father, one set that came from the mother. So you have maternal germline expression, you have paternal germline expression, and I know it gets cleared off the, the sperm don't come in with, with Sempe. So it seems to me that either the domains that are mapped in the embryo are actually separate. There's a separate set of paternal domains and a separate set of maternal domains. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, that, that in fact the RNAi component is, is significant and that it's maternal RNA mm -hmm. that does the job on both the paternal and the maternal chromosomes. Do you have any? Yeah, it's really intriguing. There has to be some sort of trans factor, right, that acts on yeah. the sperm chromatin to specify the maternal expression state. Yeah. And so I, we don't know what the mechanism is, um, but what you're saying is true. Either there's, I don't think that there, it's probably not the case. My guess is that there are not two separate states and that there's some trans factor in the oocyte that specifies the positions on the sperm chromatin. But it, it's difficult to see how you, we can distinguish the paternal and maternal chromosomes. It, maybe you can use polymorphisms. Somewhere. Yeah, we're doing some stuff with um, interspecies crosses that might be useful for that. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you can distinguish whether it's Germ the lack of germline transcription uh, 
that's specifying centromeres or the late replication of, of those regions in the germline, hmm. which might be a strong correlation, but it could, could be a completely different mechanism. Right. Um, the, just off the top of my head, the, my initial response to that is that these domains are relatively um, short, and they're de demarcated by gene boundaries pretty specifically. So they correlate with the gene transcription units pretty tightly. Uh, 